All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so the topic that we're talking about is APA citations. And uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is why you would cite. So kind of what are the reasons behind doing citations? Um, and the reason I like to talk about that is um, a lot of the things that I talk about later, I think, will make more sense when we kind of think about what's the reasoning behind citing in the first place. So then the next part is going to be, very quickly, uh, the basics of doing citations. Um, so again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I don't. There's a lot of online resources that are really good for that. So there's really no point in me doing that. But I'll point out some of those resources. Uh, the place where I want to spend the most of my time are some of the topics that often come up with students um, as a cause of sort of concern and misunderstanding um, that we get asked about frequently that are kind of related to the the idea of doing citations. Um, so I'm going to spend the most of my time there. Um, so why cite? Uh, of course, the one of the reasons and probably the first thing that a lot of people think of is giving credit where credit is due to avoid plagiarism. Um, so that's just a convention within the scholarly world of, uh, you know, and sort of just basic fairness of giving people credit for the work they've done. Um, of course, avoiding plagiarism, that's a very serious offense. So even giving the, you know, making the appearance that you're taking credit for something someone else did is a very serious thing. And it has cost, you know, a lot of people uh, their academic career. So it is a very serious thing in and of itself. That's, you know, reason in and of itself to be cognizant and aware of of uh, you know citing, but there's some other reasons why you do it as well. And so, giving evidence of your scholarly process. So this is if you're doing a, a research project for um, a, you know for a class or you know a paper, term paper, project, whatever. The citations give evidence to the whoever is reading it. Your instructor almost certainly is probably the only one, only person reading it. Um, of your scholarly process. You're not just making the stuff up. You're not just sort of pulling this out of left field that you did research, you look things up, and you're building your argument from that. Um, related to that is allowing the reader to fact check your work. Uh, that's really an important reason for citing too. So if I'm writing a paper and I make a claim that in such and such article, you know, they there's some claim written there, and I'm paraphrasing that. The person who's reading my article may, or reading my paper or whatever, may want to double check that claim themselves. And so the citation, a proper citation, gives them the ability to do that. Um, so I kind of put all this out there because it, we'll come back to this reasoning as we move along um, with some of these kind of special scenarios. Um, so I, I kind of like to avoid the idea that. Uh, you know, you're just doing this for uh, some sort of punishment from, you know, faculty members to waste time to do citations. Like, there are real reasons for doing this. Um, and speaking of which, in terms of places to go to get help, uh, there are a lot of online guides. I'm going to show one in a moment here. Um, there are others that I'll talk about later as well. I also want to, you know, your instructor, that's also a source for uh, info on this. What style do they want? Again, like I said, if you're doing a project for a class, uh, in all likelihood, your only audience is going to be the instructor, the only person who's going to read your paper, and you know, probably is the instructor or the TA or whatever. Um, so, you know, keep taking into account their preferences is a really good idea, is a really good practice. So this is, I kind of am belaboring this point a little bit because this is something that comes up where students will uh, come to the library and they'll bring something from their a faculty member who says, you know, no, you put the period in the wrong place here uh, or this shouldn't be italicized. And they will come to us and ask us to kind of settle the argument. And I always think that, you know, there, there's really no point in doing that. You know, your audience is the instructor. You're doing the citations for them, so why not just 
follow the standard they want. Um, you know, it's not really an argument worth having to fight about italics and periods and semicolons. Um, so, you know, given that they're probably your only audience, you might as well give them, uh, you know, deference in terms of what style and stylistically what they want. I think a lot of times people will say cite in APA and maybe some instructors not realizing that, you know, it's in its sixth edition, maybe in their mind they're thinking of a prior edition. Regardless, it's best to just kind of follow their guidance. And then also librarians. Um, so the way that we typically help is giving instruction in terms of, you know, how would you cite this source um, when there's sort of a question mark or a special case. What we won't do, I mean, we won't do the citations for you, and we typically will not proofread a list of citations. You know, if you have a list of 30 citations, we're not going to proofread it for you. But if you have specific questions, um, we'll typically be able to uh, offer guidance in that. Um, all right, so in terms of getting guidance, there's a lot of good resources. So I'm actually going to go to... Uh, library website, and where I'm going to look for this, I skipped a few of these browsers, um, is we have a guide, so if I just click APA here, um, APA uh, citation style, or APA here on research guides, um, this is where I typically go first of all uh, when I have questions, is clicking on there, and uh, this is a resource created by one of my former colleagues, um, and it shows how to cite all sorts of different formats. So like if I have a journal with four authors, here we go, journal or article with three to seven authors. Um, and it's, if I scroll down, it gives me the general format for the in-text citation and the reference. And it will show me some examples of how what that format looks like. So I mean, it's it's pretty simple. Uh, stuff. Um, and there's all sorts of resources like this. I'll talk about a few more later on uh, that I like, but this is one that I sort of my first place to go. Um, you know, if you're just looking for the nuts and bolts and the mechanics of where does the period go, where does the, what's italicized, what isn't, all that sort of thing, I just go to a site like this, in fact, this very site, um, and I typically get my answers there. Um, so anyone with an internet connection can get good resources uh, in, for helping them format citations. And I'll talk a little bit later about tools that can help automate that process. We'll come back to that later on, though. Um, so that's where I typically go for guidance on citations. But the place where I wanted to kind of spend most of my time this evening is looking at some of the topics that come up for us um, that oftentimes cause students confusion when it comes to citing. So direct quotes versus paraphrasing. Um, so the rule is when you use a direct quote or a verbatim remark, you always display it in quotation marks. Um, so I have an example here, which is completely fabricated. So don't worry, this isn't this is an actual I mean, real article. Um, this is something I made up. But you can see the part where I'm saying it's taken verbatim. I put in quotes, um, and then the in-text citation, the typical in-text citation for a paraphrase, as we'll see in a moment, is the last name of the first author and the year. If you have a direct quote, you'll also put the page number or the paragraph number. So if you're using a website that doesn't have pages, you would indicate with P-A-R-A -A period what para, which paragraph the, the quote is from. So the key point that I want to make here, though, isn't you know the mechanics of um, citing quotations. It's that this is something that comes up with a lot of uh, students is you don't want to be over-reliant on quotations. Um, this is just kind of a bit of writing advice uh, that I think trips people up. Um, not being over-reliant on quotations. So you can quote them, and here's, or you can cite them, and here's how you do it, and that's fine. Um, but don't do it 
too much uh, because really with uh, writing an article or writing a paper for a class, the instructor or whoever it is who's reading it, they want they want to hear your voice. And so if you are too reliant on citations, it seems like you sort of took a shortcut that you know your paper is just a string of other people's words. Um, that's again, like I talked about, evidence of scholarship. You know, part of that is the synthesis of the resources you're looking at. And so direct quotes, synthesize that into your own language. Um, that's the, the better way to do that. Um, some case, and sometimes it's necessary to have direct quotes, but really try to limit that. Um, as opposed to paraphrasing, and so what's you know, if I here's a sentence where I've paraphrased, and then here's the citation. Typically, this is the in-text citation for a, a paraphrase: is last name of the first author, and the year of publication. Um, what's interesting is in the APA guidelines, they actually encourage you to also include the page number, even in a paraphrase. To be honest, I don't think I've ever seen anyone do this, um, and it's something. It's not a requirement. They say encourage. Um, so it's not a, I don't think it's an expectation anyone has, but the idea is, is out there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but again, paraphrasing is always best. So I'm not going to, the, it's not the point of this class to talk about best practices and paraphrasing. Um, you know, that's what the, what the line is in terms of, uh, what's what language is too similar and so forth um but um so what uh so those are what I kind of wanted to say about direct quotes and in paraphrasing um so citing websites this is a common issue that comes up that we get asked questions about a lot and it's not because the citation style for websites is challenging or confusing um, it's that more that the websites themselves don't provide the information you need um, so if I go to a journal article you know they're all pretty uniform in terms of having the author, the title, the journal, the volume issue, pages, all that sort of thing. Um, books the same way. They're very uniform in how they present the bibliographic information. Websites do not. And that's, I think, something we've all run into. So, um, you know, occasionally there are websites that do provide all the information. So in this example, you can see there's the URL, have the title, have the uh, date of publication, and the authors. And those are the four pieces of information. So whenever I look at a website and I'm thinking about citing it, automatically in my mind I'm thinking, what's the title of the website? You know, I would say social media update 2016, semicolon, subtitle, Facebook usage, blah, blah, blah. Who are the authors? In this case, it's specific people listed. Uh, what is the date, November 11th, 2016, and what is the URL that's up here? Those are the four things I need. So title, date, authors, URL. So once I have that, I can easily format a citation. So of course, this is the best case scenario. And in the case of probably the majority of websites, this information isn't so obvious. So what I am going to do is look at a couple examples. So I'm going to go to this web page. And again, I said the four pieces of information, the URL, so I've got that up here, right? It's pretty obvious. The title, you know, what would I call, I to me, the title of this page is Leading Causes of Death. That's the other thing is that there's oftentimes a lot of wording around in terms of how they create these. Um, to me, the most obvious title is going to be Leading Causes of Death. Uh, in terms of the date, sometimes you have to go to the bottom. And in this case, March 17th, 2017. So that's 
So date, title, URL. Author is the problem here because I obviously some human typed this up, but I they don't indicate who. So we go with what would be referred to as corporate authorship. Um, and so what I'm going to do is what entity, what corporate entity is behind this, or what body of people is behind this, and I would say it's National Center for Health Statistics. Um, but there's also CDC up here, so how do you deal with that? So what I'm going to do is go back here, and I'll show you how I would handle this. So National Center for Health Statistics, it's the corporate author. Corporate doesn't mean company, it just means what group of people. 2017, March 17th, leading cause of death retrieved from. Um, so a corporate author with government agencies, there's several ways of doing it correctly. This is the way I would do it, is you pick the um, most specific agency that's responsible, and you can just do them or do that as your title, so National Center for Health Statistics. It's also technically correct to give the kind of rundown of the organization. So it's Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, specifically the subgroup National Center for Health Statistics. So I could do the larger organization, comma, and then the more specific organization. Oops, sorry. Oh. Um, below that, typically this isn't necessary. So either of these is technically correct according to APA. I tend to go with this just because it's less cumbersome to do, um, doing the most specific organization. So let's look at another example, and I will have to come out of there. Uh, so here's, so again, whenever I go to a web page and I'm thinking about um, citing, I'm looking for four pieces of information. The title, the URL, the date, and the author. Um, so URL, pretty easy. The title, honestly, I would just say accreditation. I suppose some people could say about us, colon accreditation, but I would, I might just go with accreditation. It's the biggest word there. It's at the top of the biggest block of text. Um, the date, there's no date listed here. So if I go all up and down this page, there's no indication of the date. Um, in terms of the author, uh, it's clearly the GW School of Nursing. So the proper way of that would be like the George Washington University School of Nursing. That would be the corporate author, the, the group. Um, and so again, my four pieces of information, date, I don't have, author, it's going to be a corporate author because there's no people's name listed here, although obviously someone wrote this. Uh, the title, I'm going to say accreditation, and the URL. So let's go back. And so that's the way that I did this, is I did it this way. So the George Washington University, comma, School of Nursing. Uh, so again, I did the larger group, George Washington, the George Washington University, and then comma, the subgroup here, I want both because school of nursing without GW, there's all sorts of schools of nursing. Um, so that, it, in this case, I think having the larger body listed makes, helps the sense of it. There's no date, so I just put ND for no date, N period, D period, accreditation, retrieved from this page. Um, so that's how I would do that. So basically it's cite what you see. <coughs> Look at the page. Can you figure out the four pieces of information that we need um, to do a proper citation? The date, the author, the URL, and the title. Um, and do the best you can. Uh, so sometimes it's, oftentimes, usually I would say it's going to be some corporate author. Um, in terms of whether you put the overarching organization, like George Washington University, or not, as in my prior case where I didn't put it, National Center for Health Statistics, I didn't put CDC, although I could have. Um, I would just sort of follow what makes the most sense or what do you think is going to help your audience the most without sort of being cumbersome and pedantic about it, you know. Um, to me, putting CDC here is sort of 
that's not really necessary, but putting George Washington University here is it's very necessary because there's hundreds and hundreds of schools of nursing. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so the month for, uh, if it's available, yeah, for a website, oftentimes it's not available. Um, month in the day, you put as much information as possible because one of the things is websites will get updated on a regular basis too. So I might come back to a website, the exact same URL, you know, and actually that's what happened was when I was working on these slides, um, I came back to some of the pages that I had and they, it was the exact same URL, but it had been updated since the web page had been updated since the last time I taught this session. And so I had to, and so you want to indicate which version of this web page were you looking at, um, you know, based on what update. So for imagery, um, again, this is not particularly challenging in terms of how to do the sighting. It's it's one of the electronic online image. It's, you know, there's certain bits of information like any other citation that you um, look at. The point that I want to make about citing images is which images to use. So I think this is something that, uh, like if you think about if I'm using a journal, when you're using images, so let me back up a minute. When you're using images, uh, proper citations are important, but there's also going to be the issue of copyright. And so I think for a lot of people, they sort of assume that if you cite something that that, um, you know, that that's good enough for copyright. Uh, it's really not. So people still, copyright and citation are two different things. One is an ethical requirement, citations, you know, if you don't cite a paper, you know, you're not going to be fined or go to jail, but you may get kicked out of the university, I suppose, if you're egregious enough in what you do. Um, copyright is an actual legal thing, and that is that people have ownership of materials they create as soon as the material takes a tangible form. So a photograph or an image is the tangible form. That is the, you know, tangible manifestation of of the, the thing. And so that is copyrighted. Um, this hasn't been an issue in what we've talked about so far because, you know, if I read a website and I paraphrase part of it, I'm not violating copyright. I'm not, you know, I'm not cutting and pasting an image of that website into my work. Um, I'm just paraphrasing it and citing it. You know, it's not a copyright issue to cite something or to paraphrase it. It's a copyright issue if you use the entire work, if you cut and paste the entire work into your work, and that's what you do with images. And so what I want to point out here is to avoid the issue of copyright, one of the great ways around that is using Creative Commons licensed images. So I'm going to uh, go back to the web and... Um, so there's a number of ways of getting Creative Commons licensed images. Um, so one of the ways that I like to do that is the Google Advanced Image Search. You actually have to Google Google Advanced Image Search. If you just go to the Image Search, um, it won't. The Advanced option isn't there. You actually have to search for Google Advanced Image Search. Um, let's do this. And then say I want a picture of, you know, a dog. Um, and then what you can do is, as opposed, you have all these things, but one of the things you have is used to drive. So I can say I want ones that are free to use or share, which means that the person who posted the image to the web has posted an addendum to the metadata of the file of the picture in which they have uh, linked it to a Creative Commons license. So Creative Commons is, you know, like I said, anytime a work takes a tangible form, um, uh, you know, that's, it has a copyright, but people can forego that and they can make the choice to attach a Creative Commons license to their work in which they say, basically, I don't care who uses this, do whatever you want with it. Um, and so that's what I'm looking for here is usage rights. I'm looking for free to use or share. So I'm looking within Google, 
images, I only want to see um, those that have, in which the creator of the image has appended a Creative Commons license to it. So I'll do a search, and I can get all sorts of great pictures of, of dogs, you know, in this case. So, um, so if I pick one of these pictures and I go to the websites, um, usually it'll describe in more detail what that means. So, let's see picture. Um, let's see. Okay, so this is the license. So to use this website, apparently, um, the person who put this picture up there said they were okay with people reusing this, free for commercial use, in fact. Um, but anyway, so that's, I would feel very comfortable using this picture. I still have to cite it. So it, just because it's Creative Commons doesn't mean I don't, I don't have to cite it. I still have to cite it. Uh, not citing it would be a form of plagiarism. But um, there's no copyright issue with that. So in terms of citation of images, you know, it's pretty straightforward. There's a, on the page that I showed, there's, author surname, first initial, you know, that was on the, the year it was taken, title of the artwork, did they put a title, um, and then the format would be something like online image or electronic image retrieved, you know, today, February 28th, 2019, from this URL. Um, and then there are times, like if there's no author, then you would put subject. So I would say for that last one, you know, dog sitting on the beach, electronic image of dog sitting on a beach, you know, uh, if there was no title to it. Um, so here's, you know, here's one. Uh, we won't go to the image, but it's an image. In fact, that does not have a title or an author. So it's untitled image of sleeping cat retrieved October 20. 2nd, 2018 from this website. Um, the key thing here that I want to point out is when you get into images, you're now getting into copyright. This wasn't a problem when we were talking about books and journals because, you know, the way that you use those, you're not cutting and pasting it into your work. You're reading it, paraphrasing it, and then typing it into your work. It's not a, it's not a copyright image. It's a plagiarism image, or a citation plagiarism image issue still, but when you get into images, you're actually using someone else's work, um, and that's where Creative Commons is helpful. So secondary sources, this is another issue that comes up a lot with students, um, the use of secondary sources. So APA strongly discourages the use of secondary sources, and by secondary source, I mean I read an article by author A, and in the article they cite work by author B, and I want to cite the work by author B, um, you know, and so I'll show an example in a second. So APA strongly discourages doing this. You know, the by far and away the best choice is find the cited article, read it yourself, and then cite it directly. Don't cite the secondary source. And, you know, the reason for that, I guess, is kind of obvious that it could be misquoted and you'd really be surprised perhaps at how often that happens where people misquote a source. So you're sort of, you can't take the the author of the secondary source, you can't take their word for it that the initial article says what they say it said. Um, you know, or else if you do it that way, you're paraphrasing someone else's paraphrase of the original topic, you know, and you kind of, I think we all have that sense of um, how information gets distorted. You know, it's Roger overheard Carolyn saying that Jane doesn't like you or something. You know, it's getting information secondhand is dangerous because the you don't know what's happening to it along the way. So this citing a secondary source is really paraphrasing someone else's paraphrase usually, and that's not it's not a good practice. So far and away, the number one thing you should try to do is get the original article and verify the information yourself and then cite the original article. So I have an example here, and this is a totally fictitious example that I wrote myself uh, 
earlier. Um, so don't bother to try to look up this article. It's totally fake. Um, but in this article, let's say I was writing an article, and this article is written by Marvin. Uh, that's the last name of the first author of this article. And they cited this article by Wells. And I want to cite this article by Wells. I think this is a really interesting point, and I want to include this point about you know the certainty of invasion from Martians in my article. Um, this is what I'm talking about with secondary sources. The number one thing I should do, I mean the absolute right answer, is I should try to find the Wells article myself. Even though I read it in the Marvin article, I should try to look up the Wells article, read it, and confirm that Wells does in fact say this in his or her article. However, let's say I can't. I let's say I can't find the article. I try interlibrary loan. I try everything I can think of. I cannot find the Wells article. Um, so what can I do in that case? And this is the kind of secondary source issue. So I came up with three options. One is I could cite it, and then I could say to myself, well, Marvin apparently was able to read the Wells article, and Marvin indicates that Wells said this, so I'll just trust that, and I'll go ahead and cite Wells. Um, I didn't find the Wells article, but I'll just go ahead and cite it, because that's where this idea comes from. You know, I'm taking Marvin's word for it that Wells did say that. Uh, the other option would be I could cite the Marvin article. You know, I just read it right here. This article is written by Marvin, so I'm just going to cite Marvin. The third option is something like this, which is Wells suggested that our planet will be invaded as cited in Marvin. So this would be the in-text citation as cited in Marvin. So hopefully it's clear that this first option is by far the worst. You do not want to do that. When you cite something or put it in your work cited, you are absolutely implying that you read that article. So honestly, I would say doing this in the case where I can't find the Wells 2015 article, but I'm just going to go ahead and cite it anyway, because Marvin says that's where this idea came from. I mean, to me, that's sort of like, academic dishonesty, because it's the clear implication when you cite something is that you read that article. Um, and that's clearly not the case here, where I couldn't find this article. So you can't vicariously cite something or cite something secondhand. The second one is better than the first, but still, it's I think it's a little misleading. And so it's indicating that Marvin was the source, the original source of this idea, which it wasn't. It was actually this Wells article. It's where I read this thought, but it's not the original source. The much better is clearly the third option, which is having this particular type of in-text citation is a strong, indicates to the reader that, okay, you know, they know what happened here, that this is a secondary source. So you're being very transparent. And again, that's evidence of scholarship, being transparent. Those are important uh, things about citing. Um, and so, yeah, I would say the first one is you absolutely cannot do that. There's, you cannot vicariously cite someone. If you didn't read it, you cannot cite it. You cannot have it in your work cited list. Um, second one is more is probably better, but still not ideal. Third one, I would say, is, is the best way to go. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about before I wrap up is um, sources with more than one format. So this comes up all the time. Uh, if you look on that website that I showed you, um, you know, there's lots of formats. So there's one of the ones that comes up all the time is I have this government publication that I found online. So, you know, more and more, of course, government publications are finding their way onto websites. So how do I cite it? There's a government publication format in APA, and there's also a website format in APA. And it's, so there's one source that kind of matches two different format types in APA. And so the one that I would, the way that I always uh, would advise on this is 
pick the format that matches how you found it. Did you find it on the web, then cite it as a website? Um, and so in the example of like a government publication or a government report that you found on the web, I would cite that as a website, even though it's a government publication and there is a government publication format in APA. Um, and my reason behind that is thinking back to why we cite. And the third thing that I mentioned was for, so your audience could track down the citation themselves and confirm that you used it correctly. So if I were to use the government publication format, there's no place in that format for the URL. So I can't include the URL in that. And so it would not be possible for my audience to track down where I got the information. I got it from this website, um, so I want to cite that particular website. Um, so for me, it's always what format did you find it in and think about, you know, think about your audience. If they wanted to track this down, you want to give them enough information that they could find where you found it. You know, if it's published in more than one place, that doesn't matter. Where did you find it? Um, that's what you want to be transparent and honest about. Um, so that's how I usually answer that question of sources that match more than one format. Uh, so that, that's uh, so just kind of to wrap things up, talking about some time-saving tools. Um, one of these is RefWorks. So I'm not really going to go into any detail on this um, because we have a class I think that my colleague's doing next week that through the same bunch of classes, online classes on RefWorks. So RefWorks is a citation management program that allows you to, that will automate the whole process of creating citations. Um, so it's a really great program, or a real, really great piece of software, freely available to all, everyone in the GW community, and I would absolutely 100% suggest using it, because um, it's a major time saver when you actually go to write up your manuscript or your paper or your assignment. Um, but I'm not gonna get into that because my co co colleague is gonna talk about that next Wednesday. Um, this was the APA guide that I talked about um, through the library. There's a lot of great resources. Um, another one is the OWL online writing lab from Purdue University. So OWL, like the bird. Um, so if you just Google OWL Purdue, you'll come to it. It's a great set of resources on citations. Another one that I really like is the APA style blog. So this is a blog that was created by the folks who do APA, and they they post on this blog like different like the one one they did recently was how do you cite Instagram? So they'll take like tricky citation situations, and then the experts who actually work at APA will answer the best way to do that particular citation. I use that one all the time, and it's really helpful with more. Um, you know, tricky citation situations. So there's a lot of great resources. The Himmelfarb guide that I showed earlier, where you go to our front page and you type in APA in the resource guide. The APA style blog is a great tool. The OWL, you know, OWL Purdue Online Writing Lab Purdue. Um, all great tools to go for this information. But if you want to automate the process, use something like RefWorks. Um, so again, before I finish, uh, where to go for help? I just talked about guides. Again, your instructor. I really think that you know, in most of these cases, your instructor is your only audience, and so I would just go with whatever, you know, whatever guidance they give. Um, and then you can also contact librarians. So there's my contact information, and we can help with if there's like a tricky situation of how would you cite this particular source or how would you advise doing that, um, you know, we're more than happy to help with that. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to proofread a whole bunch of citations, but I can certainly help with any tricky ones. 